Thank you. So thanks so much, everyone, uh, for coming today. Uh, we've got quite a, quite a big room. If you wouldn't mind sort of coming in toward the middle and coming up to the front, uh, I think that may make the conversation we're going to have a little bit later uh, a little bit more of a conversation and less of a sort of 
us, us talking to you. Um, I'm really delighted to, to welcome you all to today's workshop uh, on well-being in the digital age. Uh, my name is Molly Lesher. I work in the Digital Economy Policy Division of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, uh, the OECD, which is here in Paris. We really focus on trying to develop better policies for better lives. I'd also like to, to very much thank the other co-sponsors uh, of the workshop. We have Carlos da Fonseca from Brazil, uh, as well as Mark Rotenberg from the Civil Society Information Society Advisory Council, or CSAC. Now, we really decided to, to propose this workshop because we increasingly see that digital technologies have both positive and negative impacts on the overall well-being of people and communities. And we really need to develop uh, appropriate policy responses. Indeed, well-being is one of the focuses of the OECD Going Digital Project, uh, which aims to help policymakers better understand the digital transformation uh, that's taking place and to create a policy environment for it to, to prosper. Uh, now, well-being is, is a specific focus of the OECD Going Digital Project. Uh, this is really ongoing work, so your input on it is really much appreciated. Uh, my colleague Fabrice Martin will discuss this in a bit uh, more detail, but what we really see right now, what's emerging from the work is that uh, designing appropriate policy responses uh, is becoming increasingly complicated uh, because of the radical way in which digital transformation is, is impacting all of our, our lives. So for example, we see a growing pressure to compete with machines in the workplace. Uh, the use of algorithms and digital platforms enabling patient-managed health care and more efficient service delivery. But on the other side, you see the related uh, ethical and privacy concerns and the impacts of automation on children's development and human relations all illustrate how the new uh, digital context affects the drivers of individual well-being. Now, this workshop really help, uh, aims to help some, shed some light on how policymakers can develop a whole of a government policy framework that balances all of these different uh, dimensions and all of the positive and negative uh, impacts. So now we're first going to hear from uh, Fabrice Mertin to discuss the work he's leading uh, on measuring well-being in the digital age. We're then going to hear from the distinguished members uh, of our panel, which are, I'll introduce separately, otherwise uh, you're not going to know who they are right now. And then we really want to have an active exchange uh, with you all, as well as with those folks uh, who may be online. So now I'm going to turn over uh, to Fabrice uh, to, to come and to sort of present the ongoing work. Fabrice is the head of unit on the OECD Household Statistics and Progress Measurement Division. He's also an associate researcher at Sciences Po in Paris, and his work uh, really focuses on well-being measurement, uh, the long-term dynamics of economic development and economic policy. So Fabrice, the uh, floor is yours. Thank you, Molly. Good morning, everyone. It is my pleasure today to introduce this new OECD report entitled Wellbeing in the Digital Age. This report is at the junction of two strands of work. Uh, first, our work on well-being. Is it working? No, I don't manage to change the slides. So the first uh, strand of work is about uh, well-being. Uh, this activity has taken place in the aftermath of uh, the Stiglitz uh, saint fit to see uh, commission. It has uh, led to several key outputs uh, from the OECD, such as the Better Life Index and uh, the Health Life uh, Well-Being uh, Framework. Can I have the, the next slide, please? Yes, this one. In this well-being framework, one measures uh, well-being today by highlighting 11 key dimensions of uh, well-being, uh, health, education, income, uh, security, jobs, and so on and so forth. The second strand of work, next slide, please, is a going uh, digital uh, project, uh, which involves several directorates at uh, the OECD and uh, reviews uh, the impacts of the digital transformation 
on society and uh, the economy. Our report will focus on people. What does a digital transformation uh, have in terms of consequences on people well-being? Next slide, please. We aim to make three key contributions. One is to provide a comprehensive review of the positive and negative impacts of the digital transformation on people well-being, what we call the opportunities and the risk of uh, the digital uh, transformation. Secondly, we operationalize uh, this uh, conceptual framework, in a sense, and create synthetic indices of digital risk and opportunities in order to map countries in this dual space. And thirdly, we highlight the data gaps uh, that still exist in uh, this landscape. Next slide, please. Our overarching message uh, could be summarized uh, into the following sentence. Safe technologies can improve the life of those who have the skills to use them. So this message is really two-sided. On the one hand, we acknowledge the many opportunities uh, that the digital transformation brings about as it provides information for free, it expands consumption bundles, and it also yields efficiency gains. On the other hand, there are several risks, actually uh, three main risks. One is the digital divide um, as uh, people differ in terms of internet access and above all usage and people also have uh, different levels of uh, digital uh, skills. Secondly, uh, digital literacy is difficult to acquire. Digital literacy can be defined as a complex bundle of uh, cognitive and emotional skills that are needed to navigate safely into the digital world uh, in order to sort out information quality, have self-control over one's uh, digital involvement in order to avoid mental health uh, problems. And thirdly, digital insecurity uh, issues uh, which are linked to data privacy, cyber hacking, and cyber bullying, for instance. So a happy digitalization would actually require equal digital opportunities, widespread digital literacy, and safe digital environments. Next slide, please. Uh, for the sake of time, uh, I cannot enter into details, obviously, but this illustrates what uh, the report brings about. This is uh, the list of key impacts from uh, uh, the digital uh, transformation on people's well-being. It is actually a table for, uh, for each dimension of people's well-being. One has reviewed both the opportunities and the risk uh, entailed by the digital transformation. Next one. Next one. We also try to operationalize this conceptual framework by uh, listing some indicators for each dimension of uh, well-being. Those indicators capture the key impacts. They can be either opportunities or uh, risk. Next one, please. Next one. Those indicators, 33 in total, are summarized in what we call a digital well-being uh, will. As an example, here is a will for Finland. The inner cycle corresponds to the minimum outcome observed among OECD countries, and the second inner cycle corresponds to the maximum outcome uh, observed among OECD countries. In blue are the opportunities, and in yellow are the risks. So you can immediately see that in Finland, for instance, uh, there are large opportunities and uh, relatively low digital risk. Next one. Interestingly, we do that for 36 uh, OECD countries. Uh, on the left hand side, you can see that in Italy, uh, one can observe high risk and low opportunities. On the contrary, high opportunities and low risk in Finland, as I just said. And there are also a couple of countries, such as Australia, which are characterized by uh, large data gaps. Next one. Uh, to provide a kind of uh, overview of a digital risk and digital opportunities, one creates two th synthetic indicators by aggregating all uh, opportunity subcomponents together and all risk subcomponents together in order to, to, to have uh, two synthetic indices, one for opportunities and one for risk. Here is the outcome from this exercise. Next slide, please. 
the first interesting finding is that there is zero correlation between digital risk and digital opportunities. So reaping the opportunities doesn't necessarily come with facing uh, higher risk. If you go clockwise, starting from the upper right uh, quadrant, where are countries with high risk and high opportunities? Two of them uh, can be singled out, Luxembourg and uh, the United Kingdom. Then going down, this is, this is the, the place where countries would like to be with uh, facing low risk and reaping uh, higher opportunities. One finds countries such as Norway, Finland, uh, New Zealand. Then countries uh, uh, such as Greece and uh, Czech Republic and Latvia have low risk and low opportunities. And finally, countries uh, such as uh, Hungary or Italy face high risk and low opportunities. Next slide, please. Um, when try, it is beyond the scope of this report to try to understand the, the key sources, the key mechanism behind the creation of opportunities and the emergence of digital risk. However, one notice a strong correlation between this aggregate indicator of uh, digital opportunities and access to internet, namely the share of fossils that are internet access. So having access to the internet appears to be a necessary condition, certainly not a sufficient condition, but a necessary condition in order to reap uh, digital opportunities. On the other hand, there is no correlation between uh, internet access and uh, digital risk, probably due to the fact that Digital risks are multifaceted, as I said earlier uh, in the introduction. Next one, please. And finally, there are still important data gaps to be filled uh, in, that, uh, in that field. Uh, countries such as Australia, New, Ze New Zealand, Israel, or the US still miss an important uh, share of the indicators, the key subcomponent sub indicators uh, that we have um, uh, collected. Next one. This uh, report also contains uh, some uh, statistical agenda going forward, which is directed uh, towards uh, national statistical offices and the uh, international uh, academic uh, community. This uh, paves the way for uh, filling uh, the data gaps, uh, in a sense. And to conclude, I would like to uh, express some, uh, some caveats as uh, evidence in certain dimensions about the key impacts of the digital transformation is still debated, scattered. So uh, we want to be cautious in this field and avoid uh, definite uh, conclusions. Secondly, there is a true need for harmonizing existing uh, measures. And finally, uh, uh, the statistical exercise that is contained in this report has been heavily uh, time consuming, so it is uh, not something that can be replicated uh, easily, I would say. Thank you very much. So th thanks a lot, Fabrice. I think the, what you mentioned there at the end is, is very important. It's been time consuming because you've been working across all of the different policy communities at the OECD to really try to understand uh, how to measure well-being and all the, the different dimensions. We all know that having a solid evidence base is absolutely essential uh, to, to making good policies. So thanks very much for that. Um, I've asked the, now we're going to turn to the rest of the panel. Um, I've asked them to respond to sort of two, two different questions. Uh, the first is, what are the three most important dimensions of indiv individual and societal well-being in the digital age? This is a little bit trying to, to get at how you sort of assess the, on balance uh, the risks and opportunities that Fabrice mentioned. And then the second question um, is that it's, it's clear that there are both positive and negative impacts of digital technologies on the well-being of people and communities, and how can policymakers really best assess and manage those trade-offs, and that might vary, I, I think, uh, by countries. So to start us off, uh, I'm really pleased we have Ambassador Monica Aspe, who represents uh, Mexico at the OECD. 
Uh, she was previously a Vice Minister of Communications in Mexico, uh, where she promoted the implementation of public policies stemming from the telecommunications reform of 2013, uh, which really aims at universal access to tele telecom services and led to the innovative uh, international contest of a network that will provide telecom services to more than 100 million Mexico Mexicans, among other important initiatives. So, Monica, the floor is yours. say the most important part, which is that I co-chair the Going Digital Friends of Group uh, with the UK in, in the OECD. Um, thank you for, for this invitation. Uh, the, the question that uh, Molly sent is not easy because it's hard to choose. Um, the digital transformation really affects, uh, impacts all aspects of well-being. So choosing the most important is sort of a, of a diffi difficult question. So I chose uh, three areas which are very important and highly interrelated among them and where the Going Digital Initiative has done, I think, uh, remarkable work, uh, which is education and skills, jobs and employment, uh, wages, and work-life balance. So these are three very related areas that are fundamental, of course, for well-being in any of our countries. The first one, education and skills. As the nature of jobs changes, so do the skills required to perform them. And this, of course, shapes the labor markets, but this also must shape the education uh, systems, both formal and, and informal. Um, and there are upsides and opportunities, and of course, there are downsides and challenges. On the upside side, the opportunities, uh, we see innovation in learning infrastructure. We have massive, massive open online courses. We have open educational resources. So we have new educational infrastructures that can actually uh, help our education uh, systems. We have also more flexible and personalized training. Um, adaptive learning technologies allow us to have, for example, information uh, in the moment that students are performing any task. and know what's happening and influence and modify the, edu the, the teaching uh, on, on, um, on a real-time uh, basis. So there's a lot of opportunities in this sense. Augmented virtual and mixed realities also bring opportunities uh, for immersed experiences where um, uh, students can learn more in a fun and interesting environment. So this is also very helpful, especially for different kinds of learning. We all, all learn in different ways. What are the, the challenges? Well, digital, digitalization will accelerate the change in skills required. So this is happening very fast with an increase in the labor demand for digital skills estimated in 55% by 2030. So the skills demanded in the labor market are very different from those taught in the formal education system. And of course, that creates a huge pressure on, on the education uh, systems and a need for a lifelong learning and for changing also our formal education um, systems uh, for, for children. Um, we have therefore also an increase in the mismatch between the skills that are uh, generated or built uh, in the education system and those that are demanded in the labor market. So we have very large and increasingly large skills mismatch where people have so a set of skills but can't find a job for those skills and firms, companies require uh, workers with a certain set of skills that do not necessarily exist in the, uh, in the offer in the, in the labor market. So this is a big uh, social uh, challenge, of course. Uh, the second point, very related, jobs and earnings. So the, the OECD in its work in going digital estimates that something around 14% of workers are at a high risk of having most of their existing tasks automated over the next maybe 15 years. Um, what does this mean? Because, of course, jobs are not automated, tasks are automated. And when tasks are automated to a certain uh, level, then the job, of course, itself disappears. Um, so uh, this is 14% of workers, but then there's al also another 30% of workers where their jobs is going to change fundamentally because the tasks performed 
are going to be some automated, some transformed, and they will have to work every, every time more uh, with, with um, technologies. And of course, there's also new jobs. Uh, app developers, social media managers, big data specialists. So there's also job creation. So on the upside and the opportunities, we see that the internet actually does lead to the creation of some uh, new jobs. Uh, we know that uh, the there's a very important uh, potential for um, home-based businesses, for example, markets that didn't exist before for these kind of uh, firms. We also know that work jobs can become much more efficient, so that could liberate time from, from people from work to other activities. We also know that uh, the internet supports a better global allocation of skills in the labor market. So since we can go more global, we can be more efficient in the allocation of existing skills and the demand of uh, skills in the, in the labor market. And international outsourcing can help SMEs to better uh, compete. Higher productivity, of course, can translate into lower prices, new products. So there's an upside. But there's also challenges. There's a distribution effect. Not necessarily the workers who lose jobs are the ones who are fit, remember your skills, for jobs created. So we're seeing some polarization in the, in the labor market where we're seeing middle, income, middle skill um, jobs becoming either high skill jobs or low skill jobs. So it's not only a thing about jobs disappearing and others being created, but also of the kind of skills and therefore wages uh, related to the jobs that are disappearing or being, or being created. Uh, and this also has a differential impact for developed and developing countries, of course, because as we globalize these kinds of skills that are less needed or more needed are not equally distributed among all of our countries. So there's also something to think, not only uh, what, what we saw in, in, in the presentation, which is among OECD countries, some seem to be more of the winners and some more of the losers, but even more if we go to non-OECD countries, uh, there is definitely a, a, the potential for a distributional effect uh, that we need to work on through policy. And third point, work-life balance. Uh, the ability to successfully combine work, family commitments, personal life is important for the well-being of all members of a household and, of course, of all humanity. Um, so in the, the digital transformation changes this balance for the good and for the bad. So there's also the two sides. There is flexibility, which can be great. Uh, it can be great, for example, in terms of uh, gender equality. Uh, but there's the other side, which uh, can, can bring um, also long working hours uh, because of the same longer working hours because of the same flexibility and it tends we tend to see more men working extremely long hours and that creates also a, a strain of course in not only gender equality but work, uh, life work balance so policy actions what can we do in front of this uh, challenge um, Skill policies, um, th the first point is, you know, policy will set the difference between winners and losers in the digital transformation. Um, so there's a lot to do in policy. Um, we need lifelong learning. We need to stop thinking of education and something that is for children and confined to a formal education system. We're actually learning more digital skills outside of the formal education system than in the education system. So there's a lot of... Um, lessons there. Um, we need more aggressive higher education policies and li lifelong learning to reduce skills mismatch. Uh, we need to increase the number of available workers to fill jobs that support the growth of the internet economy. So train more for the jobs that are being created and less for the ones that are disappeared. And of course we need adequate social protection which is crucial to help works transit smoothly this, uh, this a transition between jobs, especially when they have been uh, displaced. Uh, labor market regulations, we can talk ma more about that uh, later, and promoting work workplace uh, flexibility. And of course, the, the gender front is very important in this transformation. Thank you very much.
Thank, thanks very much, Monica. You brought up a, a lot of really important points, and on the the, the job the uh, jobs and wages aspect, I think this notion of, of quality jobs is also something that we're seeing uh, becoming more and more uh, important. So now we're going to turn over to our who is a career diplomat, uh, having worked at the Brazilian embassies in Washington as well as Santiago. Uh, Carlos is currently the head of the Information Society Division at the Brazilian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, where he's responsible for the international uh, agenda related to the digital economy and internet governance. Uh, and in that capacity, he represents Brazil at the OECD, uh, the G20, and the ITU. Carlos, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank, thank you, Molly, uh, Fabrice. Thank you for the invitation. It's an honor to be with you guys here. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's an opportunity to, to give our perspective from Brazil. So uh, um, I have two, uh, uh, let me start my uh, clock here. So uh, I, I have two questions to, uh, to orient my, my presentation. So I'm going to try to, to be uh, uh, didactic to not to lose myself. So uh, first question is about the dimensions, uh, three uh, most important dimensions. Uh, I think it's, it's very difficult to single out three dimensions, of course. Uh, and the, the digitalization impacts m almost every aspect of our daily lives today. Uh, however, uh, being from a developing country, I think it's wise to, uh, uh, to try to uh, emphasize or to, to take into account aspects that matter uh, in terms of, uh, of de uh, development. Uh, so in that sense, uh, I would say that maybe the first dimension uh, is access itself to ICTs uh, and use of the ICTs in the sense that uh, access to ICTs is, is sort of a pre prerequisite to uh, reaping the benefits of digitalization. And, and access and use of ICTs uh, still are a, a huge problem in, in some developing countries. <coughs> Brazil is not a, uh, an exception in that, in that matter. Uh, to give you an idea, uh, a, a survey uh, carried out in 2016 uh, showed that uh, 21 million Brazilian households, uh, households still uh, did not uh, have uh, fixed internet connectivity. Uh, which corresponds to, to around 30% uh, of homes. And 4.5 million Brazilians still did not have, in 2016, 17, still did not have access to any kind of connectivity at all. So we are talking about uh, 4.5 million uh, digitally excluded, which is a huge number. Uh, and even when th there is connectivity, uh, quality and cost are another obstacle. Uh, in the case of Brazil, connectivity costs at uh, entry level for broadband services exceeds, uh, in some cases, uh, by far, the uh, affordability targets uh, defined by the Broadband Commission for Digital Development, you know, 5 percent of, uh, of the average monthly income. In, in some regions of the, uh, the Amazon, uh, subscriptions may cost up to 150 or even more dollars a month. So it's, 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 uh, it's huge. Uh, another po uh, important aspect, I think, has to do with digital skills. And uh, uh, this is important because uh, uh, it, it has to do with appropriation of Internet, what you do when you do have access. Uh, the, the same surveys I, I mentioned uh, for 2016 showed that 24 million Brazilians did not use the Internet because of the lack of knowledge or skills. Uh, the situation was even worse when uh, you consider only the aging population uh, the poorest uh, or uh, uh, girls and, 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 and women, so it's, it's, it's even worse. Um, those are probably the, the two most pressing problems, I think, because they tend to uh, accentuate disparities, uh, not only among countries, but also within a country. You have regions with more access and regions with less, etc., etc. Uh, this, uh, in terms of uh, social and, and economic development, in terms of the access to education, the access to information, the access to job opportunities, the access even to government services that are, that are provided uh, digitally. So it's, it's a huge problem. Maybe a third aspect uh, worth mentioning is uh, trust and security. 
in the case of Brazil in 2017, there were uh, 265,000 uh, denial of service attacks. It's, it's a huge number. Um, 300,000 on average, 300 and, and, uh, in all, 350,000 cybersecurity incidents were registered. Uh, 62 million people were uh, the victims of cybercrime. So it's, it's also a huge problem uh, for us. Uh, how to deal with those challenges? So this is the second question. Uh, I think that uh, from a government perspective, uh, the, the digitalization is a huge challenge uh, because uh, it, it is particularly uh, difficult to deal with that in, in terms of the role of government as uh, both an enabler of digital transformation a provider of services, because the government is also a provider of digital services, and also an economic regulator. So the, the government has three different challenges to face. Um, so I believe the, the only way to, to deal with that uh, effectively is uh, um, uh, through uh, the, the uh, development of uh, uh, comprehensive digital transformation strategies uh, that uh, take, it, take into account the, those uh, multiple dimensions involved. And those strategies, they, they must uh, point to a sort of a whole of government approach in terms of the implementation of policies. Uh, uh, if you don't have a whole of government and, and a comprehensive strategy, it's very difficult to deal with those different challenges at the same time. Uh, that, that's what we try to do in Brazil. Uh, we uh, recently, uh, in March this year, we approved a, uh, the Brazilian Digital Transformation Strategy um, and uh, this strategy is an attempt to prepare the country to face those challenges, to reap the benefits of, uh, of digitalization. The strategy was, uh, was the outcome of uh, a year-long coordinated effort by uh, the Minister of Science and Technology, together with uh, over 30 ministries and agencies. It was a huge work. Um, and uh, the, the main document uh, uh, was the, 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 the result of uh, more than six months of, of uh, daily work by a, a great number of, of, of people. Uh, <clears throat> there was a, a two-month uh, public consultation period uh, uh, which gathered over 700 contributions to our, to our, to our strategy. And uh, basically what we have now is a strategy with uh, uh, seven uh, main priority areas, uh, infrastructure, research, development, innovation, confidence and security, education and training, international cooperation, a digitalization of the economy, and digital citizenship. Uh, and for each area, the strategy establishes a broad diagnosis of the, the current situation and the, the, the challenges we face, and a set of uh, strategic goals for the next five years, and a set of, of indicators for us to measure uh, how we are dealing with that. And I'm just finishing. Um, once the strategy was approved, and it, this happened in March, uh, an interministerial committee was uh, established with the participation of the executive office of the president together with uh, a number of ministries and uh, um, uh, just I think it, 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 it is worth mentioning last but not least that this strategy now uh, is being the object of a review by the OECD. Uh, we we uh, uh, commissioned to the OECD a, uh, a peer review study on our strategy uh, with a focus on how to, imp to, be to, to, to best implement this. And the, uh, the, uh, the term of reference of this review is, is based on the uh, OECD integrated policy framework for digital transformation. So now we are really, really connected. Our strategy and going digital are sort of a part of the same process. So uh, I think this is very good. And thank you very much for the opportunity. Thanks so much, Carlos. It's, uh it's really great to see the, the framework that, that we are developing uh, in, with the multi-stakeholder model being put to, to use in Brazil. I know it's no small feat to get all of those ministries together. We see that uh, in the Secretariat trying to come to agreement on some difficult issues from uh, different policy perspectives isn't always easy, so congratulations for that. Also hearing skills coming up uh, again as, as one of the three uh, most important issues, uh, which is interesting. So now we're going to move to uh, the civil society perspective. Uh, we have Claire Milne, uh, who's long combined her international telecoms policy consultancy practice 
with pr uh, pro bono collaboration on cons uh, consumer and civil society organizations. She's worked with the Civil Society, Information Society, Advisory Council, CSAC, uh, which is part of the Going Digital Project since 2011. She's also a visiting senior f uh, fellow at the London School of Economics. Having worked on universal service in many countries, she's now most interested in helping uh, to shape new I to shape new ICTs to serve society. So Claire, the uh, floor is yours. Am I coming over? Yes, sounds like it. So thanks very much for the invitation and for the opportunity, Molly and, and the other organizers. And first I'd like to say that I'm really happy that OECD has chosen its well-being report to discuss at this IGF. Um, I know, of course, the OECD, it has that E in its name for economics, and it has to be concerned with the details of economic policy and growth. But at the end of the day, what is economics for? Well, I think most of us would say it is in order to facilitate human well-being. So that's what it's all about, and that's what the digital transformation is all about as well. So I'm pleased to have the opportunity to make my three choices of topic that I think are tops. Um, and the first of them is actually what I would call work rather than jobs, which uh, both of the, the previous speakers have already alluded to. And I didn't hear anything in what they said that I would really disagree with. So I'd like to add that um, I think we need to talk in terms of work rather than jobs. We've already heard there's going to be home-based work. We know there's going to be a lot of freelancing. There's going to be prosumption where the consumer produces as well as consuming. There will be many different <coughs> forms of work. Um, but we need to think what is work. Work is not just a productive activity whereby people contribute to the economy. It's also a very important source, of course, of income. And there's been a lot of discussion about uh, social support, possibly a universal basic income for people who don't find other sources. But it's not by any means only or even primarily financial people with work usually get a lot of their life meaning out of that. They get their social standing, they get their sense of community, a sense of what they contribute to society, and so on. And we really need to think about not just how do we keep people busy during the day, how do we keep them with a wage packet at the end of the week, but how do we make sure that these important social and psychological needs are going to be met? I think that's a huge challenge, and it's lucky that we do have these ICTs, which I believe are going to be an important part of the solution to this, as well as creating part of the problem. Um, my, my second choice would be inclusion, but I'm not going to talk about that because I'm happy. I have my colleague, Valeria, here who is going to talk about inclusion, so access digital skills for everybody and so on. My third is environment, which nobody has mentioned yet, but this is an area where, as we all know, the ICTs should be helping us to both uh, dematerialize many of our carbon heavy operations and through the data that they provide help us to fine tune our activities and minimize our impact on the environment. But at the same time, the resources they release can be used in very environmentally unfriendly ways. And although we are working towards allowing people to have more environmentally friendly choices, um, I think it's very clear that these are not choices that should be left to the market, to individuals. Policy makers, governments must ensure that those options that are available are all as environmentally friendly as they possibly can be. Carbon taxation is going to be one very obvious element there. 
so that when we make all our individual choices, they add up to something which is going to be positive for the environment through the digital transformation. I have many more things to say, but I shall stop there and hand over to my colleague. Thanks so much, Claire. Uh, so now we'll pass over to Valeria Milanas, who is the Executive Director of the Association of Civil Rights, which is based in Argentina. Uh, she's also a lawyer specializing in IT law, as well as a researcher and speaker on privacy, data protection, freedom of expression matters, and national and international conferences. She's also, like Claire, part of the CSAC Steering Committee. So Valeria, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I will bring a perspective from Latin America, which is Latin America and Caribbean, which is the area where we work most and adding a bit more of information regarding, for example, what Carlos said um, related and inclusion that Claire also make references that I will talk about that. I have to go like steps behind and go to very basic, uh, very basic point that is core uh, when we talk about inclusion. That if we take, for example, the last uh, report on broadband status 2017 from the CEPAL, CEPAL from the acronym in Spanish, which is the Economic Commission from Latin America and Caribbean, which is an office from the UN, that report marks the 56% of people in Latin America and Caribbean use the internet, which is great comparing previous years, but that means that 44% does not use internet during 2017. So I want, I, I'm trying to find a way to make this like additional approach, given that the, the main topic here is well-being, and not to repeat myself uh, talking about issues like we talk in another kind of fora we, we, when we discuss normative or kind of uh, infrastructure properly matters or data protection properly matters. But if we combine all things, because my other two topics, not because I consider the three most important, but I have to choose three, <laughs> and I choose uh, uh, this uh, topic of access, uh, ICT access and usage with this very basic point that we have to take into account, which is not only access to the internet, but the quality of the access to the internet. And I have to mention here net neutrality, zero rating plans. We, we have to think on that when we are thinking about well-being and at an individual and a social level because of the repercussions that that have socially, but I have also choose uh, a kind of civic engagement that is related also with data. Um, and when I say data, I have to point something that I mark in every space I have the opportunity, which is the asymmetry, the huge asymmetry between the subject of the data, the person that provides the data, and the ones that manage the data, because it's not only the way that the data is protected, but it's also the way that the data is used and processed. And this sensation uh, that I think that it's at some point it had to start to be measured and considered, uh, the sensation of the people of being left behind or something that they do not understand and they can do, do nothing about that because it's sometimes the field that we civil society have and it's our work because it's so complex and it's so uh, opaque in some ways that it has an impact, uh, I think, in the well-being beyond the way that the data protection laws are implemented, beyond ethics, beyond everything, we have to add that dimension also. Um, and related to data, because, um, and I will end here, related to data, uh, we have to think also in the new technologies that use the huge, huge amounts of data that are also impacting individually and socially, which are the algorithm decision-making based, uh, on inter artificial intelligence and machine learning processes, which add also um, a major dimension to that kind of asymmetry and 
feeling of the people that not understand what is happening with them, and what are the processes that are decided for them. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Valeria, for bringing up uh, an important issue of data protection uh, and privacy. We all know that that's an absolute key, uh, key quality to trust and to ensuring that uh, digital transformation uh, is inclusive. So now I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Makoto Yokozawa to come up uh, to the lectern here. He's the head professor of the Market and Organization Informatics Systems Laboratory at the Graduate School of Informatics in Kyoto uh, University. He leads domestic policy strategy in Japan uh, as the chairperson of the Personal Data Protection Task Force in the J Japan uh, Japanese IT Service Industry Association. He's also the vice chair of the Internet Economy Working Group in the Japanese Business Federation. Uh, he also co chairs or co-chairs groups in APEC uh, and the OECD, and he's been involved, uh, we're lucky, in going digital uh, from the beginning. So, Makoto, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Molly. Um, well, that's a very long introduction. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> but um, I am, this time I am from BIAC, which is a Business and Industry Advisory Committee to the OECD. You can see the logo in the uh, top, left, top right hand side. And the, uh, we are very much happy, very, very happy to work with Molly and the uh, Fabrice and the OECD, all on OECD analyst in the not only the limited to the going digital project, but many things in the digital technologies. Um, yes, um, I, uh, to, the be uh, to begin with, uh, I will just say the three focal points in my speech. One is a scalability and the structure, structure by design in well-being. And Mori has made a very good work in the uh, synthesis report, the, the latest synthesis report for the going digital project from the OECD, which, uh, you know, demographic, dem which has a demographics of the structure of the going digital policies and what we should think about the well-being and the going digital. So uh, I was in inspired by that, and I will show something about related to that. And the second one, that's one thing. And the second one is the, the new generation of the society in Japan. And maybe uh, next year, Japan G20, we will speak about uh, something about the society 5.0, which is expansion of the industry 4.0 by Germany, and well taken the, the Argentina's leadership in the G20 this year. And the thirdly, uh, I would like to uh, highlight the trust Okay, the trust is here, uh, you have the badge and you see, you see the, the word trust here, okay? <laughs> so that's, again, that very important. So let's begin with this first one, the structure and the scalability. So uh, if you can see the, the characters, um, I am just uh, talking about the smart life, smart works, and smart communities, and then smart cities, and the biggest one is a smart society. Uh, and at this time, and it's a society 5.0 by Japan's proposal. So, uh, in, in each scalability, in each scale, we have to think uh, many different things. For example, the smart life and smart works. Uh, my previous uh, panelist has spoken about the education and skill development. So, uh, that uh, well reflect here a smart house and smart office, and healthcare, Medicare, and cellular economy, which is an aging society. So, we have to look into that. And the smart communities and the diversity and opportunity which is well also uh, uh, spoken by the previous speakers. And the structural design is something that the government or, or the policy makers has to look into that. And the uh, smart cities, technology and regulation, uh, efficiency and sustainability. And uh, the, the biggest scale, uh, smart society, will be, should like, look like the design and the coordination and cross-border coordination, which OECD has, is expected to 
play a role. Okay, so this is a rough structure. And uh, also the, we have to think about the many structures like this. I won't go into this as too much, but the, uh, the from the product manufacturing or network communications, the service solution layer, and content intellectual layers and investors confidence layer, which is trust. So we have to think, we, we have many, many issues on the right hand side. So uh, all of this are related to the well-being by digital. Okay, so uh, the what is a digital? Uh, we may think about that again. So uh, the digital technology can provide the internal efficiency improvement uh, or the modularization, uh, decentralization and outsourcing and civilization, uh, serv servicization of manufacturing industry and also the globalization or localization of new solution or innovation. So many things can be achieved by the digital technology that will lead to the well-being, okay? So, uh, the, so the Society 5.0, uh, we had, uh, have a long history from the beginning of the human uh, civilization. We have the hunting society, uh, agrarian society, industrial society, and information society, and next should be the super smart society. Okay, so uh, Keidan Ren, uh, which uh, is the uh, Japan Business Federation who sent me to BIAC, is thinking about this society 5.0 uh, with connection to this SDG 70 goals, 17 goals. Okay, it's like, j just like this, and if you are interested in, you, c you can visit this uh, URL to see uh, what is the Society 5.0 and what is the actually uh, Japan business is uh, thinking about. Okay, so, and what is the technology? Um, my previous speakers already have talked about the uh, blockchain and AI, but it's not only that the 3D printers and the smart battery, uh, photovoltaic cells that are related to the sustainability, we, uh, that's all related to the smart uh, well-being. Okay. okay, so I will be skipping this and just showing this, uh, uh, the, um, some, some uh, image of this, uh, what Japanese business is doing. Uh, it is a traffic, uh, the constant, uh, traffic on society, and uh, the big data analysis and many things. Okay, so they're just speaking that. And the, the interesting one is the, uh, okay, so uh, the trust, uh, finally. So um, the privacy protection or uh, uh, personal data protection is well considered in many uh, forums, including the OECD. So um, OECD, in 1980, OECD has uh, offered uh, the, uh, the privacy guideline. It's a very famous one. It should be a very good example of what OECD can do in the, the well-being process. So uh, we have the GDPR in EU and also the APEC privacy framework as well. So both are based on the OECD privacy uh, guidelines in 1980 and that was the, uh, amended in uh, 2013. So uh, this, uh, uh, we, we would expect the OECD to play a role to, to showing the way forward like this. So uh, that's uh, what, what I wanted to emphasize. And the smart is many things. So we should think about the smart, what is smart by the digital technology. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks uh, very much, uh, Makoto. That's the first time I've heard the Society 5.0, and I'll be happy to be part of something super smart. So that's, uh, that's exciting. Last but certainly uh, not least, we have uh, Katie Watson, who's a policy advisor at the Internet Society. Uh, she supports, develops, and advocates for the Internet Society's internet-related public policy positions on access, on security, and on privacy uh, in North America. So Katie, the floor's yours. Thank you very much. Um, and you know, I really think, I agree with the things that you all have already said, and you've touched on a lot of the things that I was also going to mention. Um, but as you all have mentioned as well, you know, the internet is becoming more ubiquitous every day, and the impacts, the positive impacts are huge. The opportunities are huge. But at the same time, there is this very significant 
um, digital divide. And as the positive impacts grow for those who are connected, it widens the gap in very um, meaningful ways, and especially as we move toward this society 5.0, the areas that are unconnected, not just from you know, the internet as we think of it as a laptop or a phone, but from all of the things that come with that, are, it's going to have really massive um, implications for those communities. And so I agree, Carlos said it as well, you, know, you have to start with access. It has to be the first thing that you do is figure out which communities are unconnected, why they're unconnected, and how they can get connected themselves because it's not the same solution everywhere you go. Um, so we need to be working very closely with those communities to figure out what solutions work for them. Um, but then with that access comes the trust aspect, which a couple of you talked about as well. Because if you don't trust the internet, if you don't trust the devices that are included on the internet, then you're not going to use it. And there's, we're seeing more and more of that, especially in North America right now, um, as it relates to security and privacy. And it seems to me, you know, five years ago, it, we reached this point where everyone said, yes, you have to have the internet. And if there was an opportunity to get internet, by and large, people wanted it. But now, with so many security and privacy risks, um, there's a little bit of pushback. So I think to really build trust in the internet and not only have access, but people actively engaging online, you have to focus on all three of those things, the access, security, and the privacy pieces. And um, it's really in all of our best interest to do that because it's not until everyone's online that we can all truly benefit from what the internet could be. So as far as what policymakers in particular can do to facilitate that, um, I think it really comes down to something the internet society has talked about for years, which is the multi-stakeholder model, and it's the, the reason we're here now. When you work with experts from a variety of fields and when you include viewpoints that are maybe different from the way that you would approach a problem, you're so much more likely to get innovative solutions to these issues. Um, and you know, it's something that I've been lucky to see in, in my current position. We work in Canada specifically right now, we're working on IoT security. And we've engaged this really amazing group of people from many different backgrounds, including government, tech sectors, private sector, public interests, academics. Um, and the kinds of solutions that they've come up with that they could all be engaged in to actually make IoT more secure are really impressive and, and not something that I think any one group would be able to do on their own. Um, and so moving forward, I hope to see more projects like that and we're, you know, we've, Senegal and France have started their own projects that are very similar and I hope that they'll continue to be used in other countries um, because it, it really does have to be a collaborative effort. We need to include more people at the table to come up with the kinds of solutions that will be necessary as this technology evolves. So, yeah, to close, I agree with what everyone has said and looking forward to the conversation. Well, thanks so much, Katie. So now's the fun part. Uh, we're gonna open it up and hopefully have a, a good and lively discussion with you all. We've also got uh, Arvin here online. So Arvin, please feel free to, to come in to the extent that you'd like. Um, does anybody have uh, any questions? The lady in the back with the iPad? Oh, no, okay. Sir? Yeah, this is Rajin Pratap Gupta from India. And I like the entire uh, presentation from Japan. Uh, I have worked uh, with WHO in the guidelines development group for digital health. And let me emphasize that if we really want to achieve what we call as an internet of trust, we would need evidence. One of the things we feel that when we are looking at guidelines or you know, doing up uh, regulations, we always feel that there is not enough evidence that we can you know, recommend adoption or scale up. So I think. Uh, this is a very impactful forum, the Internet Governance Forum, and I think this should take the nodal role of collating all the evidence which is scattered across the globe. I think we have uh, what we call islands of excellence, where we have excellent projects delivered, but we need evidence. So I think I would come down to say it is a precondition to build trust, so let's validate and document evidence so that people can use it to scale up and adopt. Thank you. Great, Thank, thanks so much for, for that comment. Uh, is there anybody else in the audience that would like to, to re ask a question to one of the panelists based on the presentations or bring up another issue that, that you think uh, is important? Sir? 
Hello? Oh. Um, this is Edmund Chung from Dot Asia, actually. Uh, sorry, I came in a bit late, but I got uh, about half of the presentation on the opportunities and risk uh, uh, indices, I guess. Um, uh, wanna bring, uh, what, what I, I want to ask a question about you know, how, how that's, how, how especially the risks part uh, is, is defined, and uh, one of the reasons why is from at, at Dot Asia we actually just launched what we called a uh, youth mobility index, and we're we're looking at a, a, a bunch of uh, indicators to think about what uh, youth digital mobility is. And one of the uh, core aspects is to change a little bit the nar narrative that is only about uh, access access and uh, freedom online to digital mobility, mobility to support youth development. Um, so I'm, I'm quite curious. I, I might have missed it, you might have already covered it, but I'm quite curious how you look at risk in terms of uh, simply the, 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 the cyber security online, privacy, or also uh, the risks for young people unable to utilize the internet, and, you know, and utilize it in an in open uh, and, and, you know, uh, uh, mobile manner in, in that sense. Not the, you know, using mobile phone, but able to mobilize uh, resources and people online. Thanks so much. Fabrice, you'd like to answer? <coughs> yeah, ver very quickly. Our starting point is uh, the OECD well-being framework, which highlights 11 key dimensions of people's uh, well-being. Health, education, income, jobs, environment, personal security, and so on and so forth. So the idea was uh, actually to review all the impacts of uh, the digital transformation on each of those uh, well-being dimensions. And for each of them, we actually found, by looking at uh, the wide literature, both opportunities and risk. Then we came up with uh, 13 indicators of digital risk, and we just aggregated them together in order to build a synthetic indicator of digital risk. Go ahead. <coughs> okay. So, so what, is, what are included in the risk ones? You, you mentioned 13 of us. Just some examples. Oh, uh, so there are plenty in the field of uh, education. Uh, one has, for instance, inequality in uh, digital uh, skills. In uh, the field of employment, you have uh, the number of jobs uh, that are destroyed, uh, as well as uh, negative effects on job quality. Uh, in the field of environment, uh, one has uh, e-waste. In the field of uh, governance, uh, one has uh, uh, in the field of uh, security, uh, cyber bullying and uh, the number of uh, uh, security uh, incidents, uh, and so on and so forth. I wonder if I might just add a quick point there, which is, uh, I think it's very noticeable, I'm sure Fabrice wouldn't argue, that when you look at your blue and yellow bars in those nice charts, they are not strictly commensurable. You've done your best to scale both sets, but you can't assume that because a yellow bar is the same length as a blue bar, there is any sort of balance there. And balancing these things is going to be quite different depending on what scale you're looking at. And obviously every individual has a different balance between opportunities and risks and aggregating them at the national level conceals a lot of that. Maybe uh, qu quickly to, to follow up on this. Actually the, the dimensions are the ranks uh, for each indicator. So in, in a sense uh, this is uh, comparable. However, uh, we are completely ignorant about the relative importance of the various indicators and uh, impacts. Uh, this, has, this is uh, the job of policymakers, uh, in a sense, to uh, highlight uh, priorities in terms of policy intervention. Hi, my name is Andrew Bridges. I'm from Silicon Valley. Um, the motto for IGF this year is the Internet of Trust. Uh, I deeply admire the work of OECD, its empirical objective, evidence-based um, uh, approaches, and I very much like the categories in the well-being uh, index. I think they're excellent. 
But it seems to me that we are facing a fundamental crisis in the world that is not an internet crisis because you think you could substitute uh, any number of variables for the word internet in the blank of trust. It could be the government of trust, the relationships of trust, the media of trust, the legal frameworks of trust. It seems to me that one essential condition of well-being is the stability of expectations and the, the confidence in the good faith of others. And that without stability of expectations as to something being true or not, and of course many things are always subject to revision, scientific knowledge is subject to revision, but without some fundamental confidence in stability of perspectives, uh, in confidence and good faith of others, I think we can't begin building anything. And my question for you is looking at the various well-being categories, where do we put that? Is that part of social capital? Is that part of civic engagement and governance? Is that part of social connections? Do we need a new criterion or does this fit well within other criteria? Thank you. I'm very glad uh, that uh, you raised uh, that, uh, that point as uh, I'm responsible of uh, a trust experiment run by, by uh, the OECD which is called Trust Lab. So we run surveys about trust, trust in others and uh, trust in uh, institutions using experimental methods. Um, this being said, it's true that trust in digital uh, technologies is not here properly reflected as it should be. And this is uh, your, your point. So in the future, we're thinking about um, broadening the scope of those uh, trust uh, surveys and uh, trust experiments in order to better reflect, understand what drives trust in technologies and uh, how can we uh, foster it, actually? So yes, you're right. Uh, trust is not yet here properly reflected. Trust is multidimensional. It's uh, about trust in institutions, which relates to the governance field. It's about trust in others, which relates to uh, social capital. And trust in technology relates to ICT uh, access and usage. It's diffusion. My only, if I may have just one quick follow-up. My, my concern is I would hate for us to focus just on technology, which in my view is a mirror of society, if we do not have trust in teachers, trust in uh, reporters, on old-fashioned paper newspapers. Um, trust in technologies to me is sort of a microcosm and can't be abstracted from it is my only concern. If I can just uh, come in here, we've been talking about the, uh, the well-being framework that Fabrice is doing, I think, a great job in moving the bar forward on sort of measurement side. But we're also uh, developing at the OECD what we call this integrated policy framework that Carlos mentioned, where we tried to see, okay, what are the key building blocks for making digital transformation not just work for the economy, but also for society? One of those building blocks is indeed trust. And the idea is you do have metrics to the extent you can, and it's the area where we are the farthest behind, and we know that. Uh, but it also you have some policy guidance uh, that OECD has developed uh, over the years. We have security guidelines, we have privacy guidelines, we have protecting consumers and e-commerce, we have all these kinds of things and the framework's trying to set out the policy case for why trust is needed to try to give some high level principles on what that might mean. Uh, and we work indeed with the multi-stakeholder model. We're not just focusing uh, on our members and trying, trying to develop this. And so that's another, I think, important aspect uh, of the Going Digital Project and trying to foster trust because what trust means to someone from China, it may be very different than what trust means to someone in France or to the U.S. And so every country is going to have to a little bit take these high-level principles and put them into their own context. You know, we can give some direction, but we can't give this sort of recipe uh, for everybody on that. Uh, so thanks a lot for, for raising that. Uh, we have any other uh, questions from the floor? Yes, ma'am. 
Hi, my name is Catherine Tai um, from SIPE, and I have a question for uh, Dr. Makoto. Uh, so in your presentation, you mentioned that um, Smart City's uh, next step is a, a society 5.0, and we all know that Smart City is definitely a worthwhile effort to better public life and then uh, to advance well-being, so human in general. So uh, I'm just curious if there are any potential risks to um, smart city because we all know that there are some state actors who are providing assistance to some non-democratic regimes and then that raise some concerns internationally. So if you can just comment on, because we all know the benefits of smart cities. So, you know, the government can be more efficient, can better provide services. So if you can just comment on some potential risks. Um, and another question, if I may, for uh, Valeria. You mentioned that there's a symmetry between a person who provides data and a person who manages the data. So I thought that that's a very interesting common observation because there's a power asymmetry, there's a capability asymmetry. And um, in this day of the age, um, a lot of corporations which also operate in non-democratic countries uh, you know, when they have these kind of a capacity to own um, their customers or users' data, what do they do with it, um, you know, in the face of this asymmetry? So if you can just comment on this. Thank you. Thanks very much. Maybe we'll start with uh, Makoto. Okay. Well, thank you for the very good question. Um, well, yes, Smart City is uh, one of the, uh, the, our invention to have the well-being with the digital technology. I agree with that. But it's not limited to the smart cities and the smart house or smart communities. Uh, they ha will have some, the same risk, the similar risk. And the, uh, I would like to highlight, someone has talked about, or already talked about it, the trust and the security. And that's one of the risks in the smart cities as well. And the, but, but adding to that, we might have to take care of the intellectual property or the, the totally different things that the, uh, the protection of children online. So maybe so many, many risks that they have the origin in the digitalization. So uh, we can, we, some, some of them we can't expect or we can't uh, forecast at all. So uh, we don't know what is the next uh, of these uh, uh, children protection or the uh, intellectual property things. So uh, we might think uh, uh, what is important is the, uh, the sharing the experience and the knowledge about the, uh, the cr in the cross-border coordination. So uh, now the smart city development is only by the, the community, local communities, local government, and very small scale. So, uh, but we might have to think of expanding or scale, expanding the scale of the smart cities. That's one thing. And I'm not quite sure if this is quite answering to the second question. So um, as I uh, mentioned, the, uh, the OECD's 1980 uh, privacy guideline is a very good example, but we have uh, two enforcement, practical enforcement of the guidelines. One is the European GDPR, which is well based on the regulation, governmental regulation. And the second one, it's uh, on the contrary, we have the APEC privacy framework, which is based on the self-regulation. Okay, that's totally different. So the, the basis is the same. So um, maybe we have to think the balancing which is better in which occasion, okay? So it's not 100, 100 perfect for all occasions, but the, uh, Japan is actually uh, taking the, the, the way middle, okay, <laughs> between the GDPR and, and the circular regulation approach. Uh, so uh, the similar things will happen in any uh, risks in uh, the smart cities or smart communities. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Valerie. Yeah, um, maybe if I do not understand properly your question, please let me know. Because uh, this point of as asymmetry is something that we try to highlight because we, uh, we understand that each time it's that asymmetry is making it bigger and bigger. And of course, it's a question of balance. 
I, and I would say that mainly, not only from states, but also from private corporations, because sometimes private corporations are even stronger than some states. At some point, some states have not a word against uh, private corporations because of jurisdiction matter, et cetera, et cetera. And for example, and I, I was listening to my colleague here, if self-regulation is something that it's okay, but it's something, it's something that also generates concerns at some points because maybe make that a, a unbalanced and a symmetry bigger. Um, I, I have not answers, but I think that given the people agency, do not forget that, that the protection rules are quite important. It's, a, it, it's a sure that maybe not everybody understand and use the rights that data protection brings because our experience in everyday work is that people, people on, on everyday basis does not properly understand what is happening with the data. And if they have to access to uh, legal instances or administrative instances, it, it can be quite discouraging to be that. So that is our work, but also the work of everybody who is involved here to understand properly what, what is behind that if we are pro properly committed with the human right, human people, uh, people center right, if we won't put people at the center, that should be the aim of the understanding. Given people agency and also implement transparency rules, explainability rules, not only when the problem happened, but from the very beginning, to make clear diagnosis, to understand, or to, to proper explain why you are adopting this kind of um, methodology or technology. And it, it will be getting uh, worse because a smart city is a reality. In, in the context that I came and that I explained these 56% um, of people using internet in 2017, which means uh, 44 people that not use internet. We, in Latin America, we are talking about smart cities. In fact, the ITU is pushing a strong agenda there on smart cities. So we have this paradox, you know. So I think that these kind of, we have to talk all the time and do not get tired of talking about this and making the points because like we all mark, we all represent different interests, that's true, but we have to find the, common, uh, the commonalities from in the diversity, you know, and, and keep on pushing that. I'm, I'm not sure if I answer your question. If you don't mind, I'd like to add something to what you said about um, the, the security risks of IoT because I completely agree with you. There are so many of those traditional risks, especially when it comes to the, to the data that's being collected. But especially one thing we're seeing with smart city devices is that the users or the people who are interacting with these devices often don't realize that they have interacted with them because they're so ingrained in traditional, um, you know, dumb applications like in street lights or sensors in the, the sidewalks and things like that. And there are some real community benefits from those things, but there's also a huge risk that if that data were to be leaked, consumers would have no idea that they were included in any sort of risk. Um, and so one thing we found that will be very important moving forward is the consumer education applications, you know, putting, whether it's putting up a sign or doing some sort of media campaign, but um, starting with a very ba basic point that this, these devices actually exist in your community is huge. I think we'll, if there's any, any more questions, maybe we take one more and then um, I'm going to let the panelists have, have something to say. Any other questions from, from the floor, sir? Thank you. <clears throat> um, most of what you've been talking about is really interesting if I take it from a government perspective, sort of gives, gives great entry points for governments to think about well-being and, and, and improve the conditions. Um, if, I, if I look at it from the individual's point of view, I, I found less hints as to uh, what can I do myself um, to improve well-being in the digital area. Is there anything you're, you're thinking about in this direction? Thanks a lot for that. Is there anyone on the panel who wants to take a stab at that? I got that. Well, again, that's a very good point. And uh, I would like to point the, the security 
guidelines from the OECD recently renewed in 20, uh, 2014, if I remember correctly. So the, the topics for uh, the business players, the biggest one is the, uh, the, the multi-stakeholderism, and that's, that says that the, the individuals are equally responsible for the, the, the cyber security. Okay, so uh, before that, the only uh, the, 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 uh, the service providers for the business or government or uh, the critical infrastructure uh, operators, they are solely uh, op uh, responsible for the cyber security. But it has changed. So uh, we also, uh, of course, uh, we have to take care of the education or the awareness uh, development of the cyber security. But, but we can't do further, we can't improve further the cybersecurity aspect without the, the collaboration of, from these individuals, as you said. So this is a tremendous change from uh, the, the, uh, the uh, government uh, top-down approach to the bottom-up approach. So maybe uh, some similar things we, you can, we can see the, uh, from all of the well-being discussion. Thank you. So I'm going to give our great panel uh, one more intervention, if, if they would so wish. Uh, Monica, you'd like to start off? Thank you very much. I will try to comment on the, on the discussion. Um, one point is the, I, I believe it's important to think of the non-competition among different aspects of well-being in digitalization. Um, I, I have devoted more, most of my career to uh, access. Uh, to, to ICTs, but however, the, the discussion of access before uh, quality of digitalization, I think is uh, we should rethink that, uh, and we do that a lot in developing countries, um, because for one thing, uh, impacts are for everyone and not just the connected. Uh, impacts on skills, impacts on the job market, that affects everyone, connected or not. So we need to think on both sides access and the quality of digitalization at the same time. The other point is uh, the quality of digitalization is also key to digital inclusion because it was talked about in the panel, this pushback because of security or privacy risks. So it actually affects uh, access and digital inclusion. And a third related point is people are increasingly object of digitalization without, without even knowing it. And this was also mentioned in the context of, uh, for example, smart cities. So we, we, there is, you know, uh, facial recognition technologies and you're, you're just walking there and you're a subject of this, um, or rather an, an, ob an object of this uh, digitalization. So we need to rethink the discussion on access. And uh, lastly, on the risks of smart uh, cities, I see uh, in the discussions of smart cities um, a risk that the model of, develop, uh, of cities in, develop, in developed countries are applied to developing uh, country cities uh, many times and they are not necessarily applicable. And I think that's a big uh, risk because buying technology uh, cannot, not, doesn't always lead uh, to, to adding to development. Um, and I think there's in, in smart cities, especially in developing countries, we should all, all, always think of the public sec service driving the digital policy and not the technology. Um, <coughs> when we don't have the same processes in place in public services and we add a la layer of, of technology, we don't get the same result in developing countries that what you can get in more uh, orderly uh, cities in terms of their processes of the de delivery of public services. Thank you. Thanks so much, Monica. Is there anyone else on the panel? Yep. Uh, yeah, thanks, Molly. Uh, I, I just wanted to, to refer to um, uh, two of the questions that were proposed for debate for us. We didn't have time to, to discuss that. One of them is the digital divides, and the other one is the, the aspects that are uh, uh, not quantified. Um, uh, I think uh, uh, f from a perspective of developing countries, this uh, uh, digital divide uh, issues is hugely important. Uh, as, as, as I mentioned before, uh, it has to do with disparities. And within the country and, and between countries, uh, and it's very difficult to deal with uh, in terms of uh, policy solutions because uh, uh, basically uh, um, 
the, the range of dimensions of digital divide, uh, they are not ex excluded, and on the contrary, they tend to accumulate. So uh, if you are in a developing country and you are a, a poor person living in an urban area, uh, access to ICTs is, is probably more difficult than if you, if you have money. But if you are a poor person living in a rural area in a, in a, in a developing country, it's even more difficult. And then if you are a poor person in a rural area and, and, and it happens that you are an old person, it, even more complex. And if you are a woman, probably it is even more complex. And if you are from an indigenous uh, descent, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it goes on and on and on. It's very difficult to deal with that. Uh, uh, and then what is the solution? Of course, uh, policies, public policies, education, uh, qualification, uh, trying to get uh, more women, for, for instance, in the ICT sector. In the case of Brazil, we only have 20% of people working in the ICT sector that are women. Uh, so, it, but at, on the other hand, and then uh, going, going back to this issue of, of quantifying, uh, one of the problems that we face in Brazil, but uh, I think in other countries uh, as well, is the lack of uh, uh, data that is, that is disaggregated by gender. This is, uh, this is a huge problem because we do have uh, uh, surveys, etc., but not always the data is disaggregated by gender, for instance, or by race. And so it makes more difficult to pinpoint specific problems and, and, and to figure out uh, specific policy solutions for those, uh, those problems. We have faced these this difficulties in, in uh, uh, establishing our uh, um, uh, strategy. So uh, I think this, this experience is, uh, it, it was very important for us because not only we tried to figure out solutions, but basically what uh, we, 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 uh, we did uh, as we uh, elaborated the policy was to really have a very clear view of the, the very different problems and the, the complexity of those problems. So now we have a, 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 a very clear uh, picture of the, uh, the, 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 the situation in our country. So I think it's uh, um, some of the things I, I wanted to mention. Thank you. Can I thank you, uh, Carlos, uh, very much for, for this point. May I simply mention that the first follow-up uh, to our report will actually consist in disaggregating those uh, well-being indicators, uh, digital indicators by gender. This will be, uh, I think, be released in March for the Genesis Day. May I? Thank you. Um, I'd, I'd like to come back to the question of what, what are our tools for measuring these developments and how things change. And um, obviously the OECD already benefits by a lot of surveys. You go around and ask people many questions. But I think there's a new set of tools which are very valuable for getting more considered decisions. Um, and getting people to face up to the trade-offs and these opportunities versus risks. And these are the tools of deliberative democracy, which we are beginning to see more of now. And I do feel that these can play an immensely valuable part, not just in helping policymakers to understand what a social balance might be for these trade-offs, but also helping to build the trust which our, our colleague here has so rightly referred to, it's trust in society. And if people can feel that their views are being taken into account, that must be positive. Yeah, I would add some aspect that maybe it complicates a bit, this perspective, but we also see from our work that it could have an impact on this well-being uh, aim that we are trying to, to, to point here, which is about surveillance. Now, nowadays, every, most, every, I won't say every country, but most countries are using surveillance uh, technologies with a proper aim of pursue crime, but we also know and we have this uh, with information that sometimes that surveillance uh, it's like diminishing the free expression of uh, 
people online and that also have an impact on the civic engagement and the possibility of make stronger states and civil participation. So that is something that is happening and we have to be aware of that. Thank you. Well, I, I should be very brief and uh, we have talked about the trust and many things and I would like to add by design, trust by design or a well-being by design. That's the work of the, the OECD and all governments and also the multi-stakeholder. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree with everything that you all have said. Um, and I'm glad that you mentioned the, the trust by design. Or the, and that comes with so many different pieces. And I think it applies in so many different ways, too. It's, in my mind, not just the devices that we use, but every different platform we use online as well should be secure, private, and trustworthy by design. Um, but I'm also really glad we brought the conversation back to access again, and especially you mentioned indigenous communities. Um, that's a, a group of people that have so often been forgotten in every possible sector. So including them in this space is hugely important. And it's not just making sure that, you know, outsider looking in, we help them get online, but really consulting these communities and asking them, you know, do you want this technology, first of all, because it's your right to say no. And then if you do want it, how can we help you? Like as a community, what do you want to do? What role do you want to play in your own connectivity? Do you want to own these networks? Do you want to, you know, own some sort of portal? What is it? But um, I'm really, really glad to hear that you mentioned that because I think it's, it has to be the next big focus for us as a community. So thanks so much. I'm not going to wrap up. We're already a little bit over time, but just to say thank you very much uh, to you in the audience. I thank you, and uh, as well as to our really distinguished uh, panel. I think you've given us all a lot of food for thought. I think Fabrice's main message that skills are the key to sort of unlocking the positives of digital transformation has been well verified. I think we've also gotten a little bit of homework on our side as we continue to develop uh, the going digital work on well-being from the policy side. So thank you very much to the panel and thanks to you if you join me in giving a round of applause. For thanks very much.